Godspeed. Two tales of survival, first on land. There's no way this is a tornado. Then on the high seas. She's been in some very severe weather conditions. From the unsinkable team to the unshakable jogger. I wasn't gonna let go. Now wherever the tree went, I was going. Their stories on today's 700 Club. It looked like a nuclear bomb had gone off. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The United Nations says the Palestinians are ready to build their own state right next door to Israel. The Israelis are worried about this news report, and they're trying to resist the international pressure supporting a Palestinian state. Chris Mitchell has the story from Jerusalem. Israel's defense minister, Ehud Barak, calls it a diplomatic tsunami. He's talking about the Palestinian Authority's plans in September to get the UN to recognize Palestine as an independent state. They are now refusing to sit to the table because they think, and maybe rightly so, that they have the support of uh, almost two thirds of the countries that are represented at the General Assembly, and they can uh, get uh, some kind of a declaration of an independent state at the General Assembly. Gabriela Shalev served as Israel's UN ambassador for two years. She's sounding the alarm that the PA's move poses a grave threat to her country. Come September, we are there. I think if nothing will happen in between, and there are still a few months that we can do many things, uh, we are in for big trouble. Shalev says the Palestinians may well use an obscure UN resolution to bypass the Security Council where the U.S. holds veto power. According to this resolution, 377, if there is not a consensus inside the Security Council, then it goes to the General Assembly, uh, which can take uh, collective measures. Collective measures could have profound consequences for Israel, including sanctions, boycotts, an arms embargo, and even the use of force. The UN might impose a Palestinian state on Israel and isolate the Jewish state. If this will happen, uh, we can be considered an occupying power in a state which is working for its independence, and then sanctions can be inflicted on Israel. That's why Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is under enormous pressure. The left in Israel wants him to make dramatic concessions to the Palestinians. He's also under pressure from Washington, where he will visit next month to meet the president and address the Congress. Most Americans may have already made up their minds. According to a new poll, 51% of U.S. registered voters oppose the Palestinian Authority if it unilaterally declares an independent Palestinian state without a signed peace treaty with Israel. 31% support it. Shalev sees hope in the American people. The people in the United States are so important for us because they have an influence uh, on the government, on the president, and I think we know and the Americans know that still, even after everything that takes place in the Middle East, we are the only democracy uh, in, the, in the Middle East, and our values are very much like the values mm -hmm. of uh, your uh, founders. Well, Chris Mitchell now joins us live from Jerusalem for more on this story. Chris, is there any precedent for using UN Resolution 377 to support uh, a Palestinian state? There is a precedent, Gordon. Uh, the first time it was used, it was in 1950, when the United States was very uh, frustrated with the Soviet Union for using its veto power during the uh, Korean War. So they enacted this Resolution 377 so they could bypass the Security Council. It was used again in 1981 when Namibia was trying to gain its independence against South Africa. And during that resolution, they said that member states should support Namibia financially, militarily, and culturally while totally isolating South Africa. And there's a lot of people who think that same kind of scenario could, uh, could unfold here in September between the Palestinians and Israel. I would assume in this that there, there's no requirement for this new Palestinian state to actually recognize Israel's right to exist. Is that true? It seems like it. It's not. Right now, just uh, this past week, 
the uh, Salam Fayyad went to Brussels and the UN had issued a report that they had qualified uh, a state. So it doesn't seem like they're going to have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, when, which that is one of the main requirements that Benjamin Netanyahu has been saying all along, that the Palestinians need to recognize Israel as a Jewish state and plus make sure that it has secure uh, borders. Is this just a way for the, the, the peace talks to be completely um, bypassed, that, the, that the, literally we could go to a U.N. resolution for a Palestinian state without including any peace with Israel? Exactly. It could be a unilateral declaration. In fact, it looks like the Palestinians won't ever return to the negotiating table. It seems like the path that they're using to statehood is going to go exclusively through the, uh, through the United Nations using this kind of obscure resolution. But it looks like uh, part of this diplomatic tsunami that's uh, ra raising its head against Israel. Already many South Africa, I mean not South African, South American states have already recognized uh, Palestine as an independent state based on the 1967 borders. All right, well tell us about the borders. Uh, you know, the, we're, we're obviously talking about area that Israel currently occupies. Uh, what, what borders are they talking about? Well, they're always referring to the 1967 borders. And if you want to see those, Gordon, all you have to do is look behind my shoulders. Look at the walls of the old city. Back from 1949 to 1967, those were the borders before the Six-Day War, where Jordan actually controlled uh, the West, what's known as the West Bank right now. Egypt controlled some of the Sinai. And uh, so when they talk about the 1967 borders, they want to go back to before the Six-Day War, which means that's going to divide the city of Jerusalem because many are assuming that, the, uh, that any kind of Palestinian state is going to have East Jerusalem as its capital, and that would mean the walls of the old city behind me would be part of the next Palestine if that ever comes to pass. Um, just from a practical standpoint, can, can the U.N. put this in when, when Hamas is controlling Gaza? It's, it's almost like a two-headed state right now. Gaza uh, is controlled by Hamas right now, and uh, the Palestinian Authority is technically, I guess, uh, in charge or part of the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. So it's almost like a, a two-headed monster right now. That's part of what uh, has been behind unity talks by Mahmoud Abbas and Salam Fayyad with Hamas. They've actually tried to unify the Palestinians, but it looks like it's not going very far. Do you have any advice for Benjamin Netanyahu? It looks like he's, um, he's, he's, he's not going to be able to do much, if anything, to head this off. Any, any response for him? It's a, it's a huge uphill battle for him. He's really between a, a rock and a hard place. Uh, if he goes too far, if he gives too many concessions, he could lose his coalition government. It looks like his address next month before the U.S. Congress, he's already been invited by Secre uh, the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, to address the Congress. He's going to use that as a way to perhaps preempt this. But uh, I'm not sure, and, and some uh, people here are not sure, that's, he can actually do enough to forestall what's, what the Palestinians are planning in September. And not only the Palestinians, Gordon, but many of the European nations are behind, uh, behind this effort. They're behind the Palestinians. Uh, the Economist is reporting right now that the Obama administration is actually telling the European nations to go tough on Israel because, uh, because he can't do it because of domestic political considerations. So a lot of people are looking both to the U.S. Congress, the American people, predominantly pro-Israel, and a lot of people are looking to prayer. I talked to somebody yesterday who's trying to uh, mobilize a global effort for, for prayer for this situation and for the city of Jerusalem. All right. Well, we'll be uh, looking forward to more on that. And Chris, thank you for the story. If you watching at home realize that uh, one of the reasons the Obama administration is looking to Europe to take the lead here is that he realizes the American people aren't behind this. And so we, we need to be mobilized to let your elected representatives know how you feel about Israel. And let's join in. Let's, let's have a global movement of prayer uh, and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If it becomes divided again, uh, there'll be no peace. Wendy Griffith has the rest of our top stories from the CBN Newsroom. Wendy? Thank you, Gordon. Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal is supporting a plan to place a Ten Commandments monument at the state capitol. Democratic State Representative Patrick Williams offered the proposal. Williams says he wants to promote the historical value of the Ten Commandments rather than their religious aspects. 
The monument would not be paid for by the state. Private groups will design and build it. Well, the National Day of Prayer can go ahead this year after a federal appeals court threw out a ruling that it's unconstitutional and dismissed a lawsuit against it. A federal judge ruled against the Day of Prayer last year, saying it amounted to a call for religious action. But the appeals court said the day is voluntary, not mandatory, and that the Freedom From Religion Foundation did not have standing to bring the lawsuit. Because even though they disagree with it, the day of prayer has not hurt them. And last time I checked, Gordon, prayer usually doesn't hurt. It usually helps. It usually does help, Wendy. Um, I, I, I do applaud the appeals court on this one, uh, but I, I wish they'd just come to the conclusion um, that these kinds of activities, um, you know, supporting a, a day of prayer, they, they didn't rule on the issue. What they said is uh, hurt feelings aren't enough to have standing in a federal court. Uh, you need to prove some actual injury, uh, something that was either taken from you or deprived and, uh, because you had hurt feelings about a, a day of prayer. That wasn't enough. I wish that they had ruled on the merits that... Um, having days of prayer is constitutionally permissible. If they'd just done that, uh, you'd, you'd walk away from a whole lot of these nonsense lawsuits. Terry? Well, up next, the true story behind the largest slave escape ever attempted in U.S. history. And then later, she sailed halfway around the world and isn't even old enough to vote. Happy Sunderland is here, and she'll be taking questions from our chat room, so log on to CBN.com right now. Today, an ounce of gold buys you two fine suits. In ancient Rome, that same ounce of gold bought you two fine togas. For over 5,000 years, gold has maintained its store of value. Once upon a time, the U.S. dollar was as good as gold because it was backed by gold. But the value of all paper money sooner or later falls to zero. Printing paper money is like an unlimited credit card for politicians until history cancels their credit line. The good news is that they can't print gold. So when you put part of your nest egg in gold, it becomes safe from politicians crashing the dollar. Find out more about the best performing assets of the 21st century from the best company in the country, Swiss America. Call or visit online now for their free educational kit. Next week. We started like our little own crew. He was a real life good fella. I wasn't afraid. I had no fear. A regular wise guy. These guys took my back. I was connected to somebody. This hitman wanted to run the mob. I was known as the up and coming star. Until the mob ran him off. I'm Robert the Crackhead. I'm going to die Robert the Crackhead. Monday on the 700 Club. 163 years ago today, the largest attempted slave escape took place in Washington, D.C. Many believe that the escape on the Pearl is one of the reasons why slave trade was abolished in our nation's capital. Even so, most people never even heard about it. John Jessup has more on this heroic tale of the Underground Railroad. It was April 15, 1848, when about 70 slaves made their way down the dark streets of the nation's capital. Mary and Emily Edmondson and their four older brothers were part of the group that boarded a schooner called the Pearl, hoping to sail to freedom. Their father, Paul, was a free man, and their mother, Amelia, was a slave, which meant her children were born slaves. Deeply religious, the Edmondsons prayed for a successful escape, knowing that it was all in God's hands. You don't realize there's a plan set for you. You just go along in life. In fact, you don't think about what's going to happen and what you're going to do. You just go on, and if it's God's will, you go on the right path. The plan, sail down the Potomac River, up the Chesapeake Bay, and on to new life. There was no wind. So they waited and waited and waited, and uh, a good wind came and took them down the river. Um, unfortunately, that wind became fierce, so they had to drop anchor in Maryland. And they got caught right where the Potomac and Chesapeake Bay meet. 
Everyone on the ship was taken back to D.C. The slaves were marched two by two, the men in chains, up to the jail. And everyone gathered to watch, not just the white anti-abolitionist people, but the black community and some of the relatives of the people who were being marched. The Edmondsons were eventually sold to a slave trader in Alexandria, Virginia. This building was once the very slave pen that housed both Mary and Emily. It now stands just 30 feet away from a statue honoring the two girls today. Even upon being captured, they walked proudly with their heads up and singing spirituals. That, that's nothing but faith. Um, and those who have strong faith know the peace that comes with it. Steal away, steal away. After their capture, the six Edmonds and siblings were sent to New Orleans. Because they were attractive and very valuable, Mary and Emily were to be sold as sex slaves. But yellow fever broke out and they were brought back to Washington. Throughout the entire ordeal, Amelia and Paul worked with members of the Underground Railroad to come up with the money to free their children. The Underground Railroad was really a, um, uh, not a physical railroad, but it was a, um, a movement of individuals, starting first with the slaves themselves, who yearned and desired to be free. They also reached out to the Christian community for help. Their pastor joined a group of Methodist ministers to raise donations to buy the girls' freedom. Lenise Robinson, historian of Asbury United Methodist Church, reads part of that letter. The case of these girls is one that claims the sympathies of the benevolent, and I most earnestly pray that the efforts of their friends may be crowned with success in securing their freedom. Matthew A. Turner, pastor of Asbury Chapel. This led renowned minister and abolitionist Henry Ward Beecher to New York's Tabernacle Broadway Church, where he preached a fiery sermon that finished raising the necessary funds. And he said to people, think as if they were your daughters. Think as if they were going to be taken away. These two young Methodist daughters. And then he pointed to their father, Paul Edmondson, who had come up from Maryland and said, here is their father. Think if you were in his place. And it, it was a magnificent evening. Now free, the Edmondson sisters joined the anti-slave circuit with the likes of Frederick Douglass. Beecher's sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, depicted their journey in her book, A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Stowe sent Mary and Emily to Oberlin, Ohio, an important stop on the Underground Railroad. When blacks came into this community, they felt this was a safe haven. Uh, it was never easy. I mean, they had to struggle, like everyone else, uh, to try to feed themselves. But they didn't have to stand in fear of uh, being turned in. Mary died of tuberculosis in Oberlin at the age of 21. And Emily returned to Washington. She married, and her descendants still live in the area today. John Jessup, CBN News. An incredible tale of heroism. The Underground Railroad, I think that we need to celebrate the heroes of that, and particularly the heroes of the faith. Uh, Oberlin College was started by Charles Finney. It was uh, one of the results of the Second Great Awakening in America. And from that came uh, the abolitionist movement that slavery had no place here. We, we needed to recognize that these were men and women made in the image of God, and they deserved to be free. When you look at the history of it, who, who took the courageous stand, and it was courageous, to say they need to be free, whether it was the Quakers of North Carolina or the people around the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia or Overland College in, in Ohio, uh, many, many, many heroes. Terry? Wonderful story. Well, thousands of miles from home, a 16-year-old sailor is lost at sea. The story of her survival is next. Got a question? Send us yours now on CBN.com. We'll bring it online with your questions from our live chat room on today's 700 Club. When you look in the mirror, can you imagine erasing years of aging? That's what I used to look like. Lifestyle Lift takes only about an hour. See the difference immediately. I'm Linda. 
I'm 70 years old. Can you believe it? Call now for a free information kit. It's quick, affordable, and takes only about an hour. Lifestyle Lift, a breakthrough medical procedure that helps remove wrinkles, frown lines, and sagging skin. Call now for a free information kit. Consultations are free. Call Lifestyle Lift today. In the next 60 seconds, we want you to qualify to be the next $50,000 home makeover winner. Pick up the phone and get ready to start dialing when the number appears on your screen. Call the number on your screen now and we'll mail you a key. If your key opens the lock in your local direct buy club, you'll be the next $50,000 home makeover winner. Operators are standing by, so call right now. Direct Buy Club is already awarded over a million dollars, and someone is going to win the $50,000 home makeover. Why not you? If the phone number is blinking, the phone lines are open. Call now to receive your key and an invitation to your local Direct Buy Club, where members can save thousands or more paying low direct from the source prices on big ticket items. Like kitchen cabinets, home furnishings, flooring, bathroom fixtures, and so much more. Call now and get your key to winning a $50,000 home makeover. Someone is going to win the $50,000 home makeover. Why not you? This week on 700 Club Interactive. For years, Abby Sunderland trained for her voyage around the world. At the age of just 16, she wanted to become the youngest person to sail solo around the world. But halfway through her journey, after all the training and all the hard work, Abby found herself no longer in control. More people have flown into outer space than have sailed solo around the globe. At just 16 years old, Abby Sunderland set out on her boat, Wild Eyes, with hopes of becoming the youngest person to sail the seas alone. But four months into her journey, Abby encountered a storm in the Indian Ocean. A rogue wave rolled her boat, snapped its mast, and changed Abby's course. Instead of breaking a record, she was fighting to stay alive. Please welcome to the 700 Club, the author of Unsinkable, Abby Sunderland. Abby, welcome, it's great to have you with us. You know, I think a lot of people hear that a 16-year-old is trying to sail solo around the world and think, who would let her do that? But the truth of the matter is you had, a, a, you had an unconventional childhood that really kind of was preparing you from the time you were young. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I really grew up sailing. I can't even remember a time there wasn't boats in the family. Um, you actually lived on boats as children, didn't you? Yeah, I lived on a bunch of different boats and took this three-year sailing trip where we lived at Catalina and cruised up in Mexico. Um, so really, my childhood was a lot different from most kids. And your mom and dad really wanted you to experience life to the fullest. I really appreciated the fact that they didn't want you sitting in front of a television set or an Xbox or just hanging out with maybe some kids that weren't encouraging you to move ahead with your life. How do you think that made a difference in your life? Um, you know, I think that really made all the difference because my life was all about getting out and experiencing the world and adventuring. And so, you know, you grow up with a completely different mindset. And, you know, while I still hang out with friends at the mall and do all that stuff, <laughs> there's, there's always something different that's there, you know, just because of how I've grown up. Yeah. There, there was a lot of um, kind of backlash that your parents and you, in a sense, had to contend with, people who just couldn't get that and who said, why would anybody let their 16-year-old child do something so dangerous? How did y'all respond to that? Well, you know, at first we were trying to answer all of it, but you know, after a while you kind of realize you can never make everyone happy. And you know, that's partly why I wrote the book. So the full story's out there. So people can see from start to finish how much preparation and you know, how many experts I had behind behind me. And it was quite an adventure. I mean, the book is a, a riveting account of all of that. You actually decided you wanted to do this when you were, what, 13? Yeah, my first decided when I was 13. You know, just some guys joking around on the dock saying I was going to be the youngest to sail around the world, and that's where the whole idea started. Now, you had your brother, Zach, who's a little bit older than you, <clears throat> had a year before you completed a solo journey. Did that encourage you? Did it, did it spark a desire to be the first 
young woman to do it. What, what impact did that have on you? It definitely inspired me because, you know, it had been a dream of mine for a while. But had I not seen my own brother do it, it probably would have just stayed a dream. Yeah. Watching my own brother work so hard and, you know, stepping out in faith and taking a shot at a big goal, it really inspired me to go and follow my dream. And it's not like, I, I want people to know this, that it's not like there were boats coming alongside of you with seasoned sailors in it that were there to grab you should you have a problem. I mean, you were in the middle of nowhere by yourself in the ocean. What was that like for you? I know there were times that you wrote about in the book that were exhilarating, but you had some problems along the way. Yeah, yeah, well, with modern technology, you know, I had an Iridium phone, I had email and things like that, but you are really alone out there. And, you know, I've always loved being on the ocean alone. I mean, you're out there and it's just so amazing, the power of the ocean. And, you know, I've never felt closer to God than, you know, when I'm out there alone. And you know, your walk with the Lord grows so much when you're on a trip like that. And it's amazing how much there is to do on a trip like that. As I'm reading your book, I'm thinking, well, she's alone, but she's very busy while she's out there. Yeah, well, it's a sailboat, you know. <laughs> Everything has to break down at some point. And you were gone for how long? Altogether about four months. Wow. And you had enough, you had to have enough food. You were not stopping anywhere to reload or any of any of that your goal was to just keep going until you made it around the world yeah my original plan was to make it all the way around non-stop yeah but you you had a, a well you had numerous points where you had issues equipment issues I mean did you know everything that you write about in the book about engines and and other other things that were on board that you wound up having to fix by yourself yeah well in the book you know it goes into all the detail of the preparation and you know at first I didn't understand it all that well, but through being with all these experts and watching them go over every system, you know, I had a basic understanding of engines and wiring and all this stuff, and so I, could, I was pretty good with it. I think your understanding was more than basic, Abby. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm reading it going, how'd she know what that was? <laughs> pretty impressive. Well, as you're going through all of this, you had something happen that was really the big issue. Tell us about the, the boat rolling and what happened. Yeah, well, you know, there were a lot of little problems I had along the way, but of course the big issue in the end was, you know, I was hit by a rogue wave, and uh, they're, they just come out of nowhere, really, and yeah. people aren't sure exactly how they come about, but um, that, that ended my trip there. It rolled it my boat took 360. took the mast off the boat? Yeah. yeah, my mast was completely gone. My boom was snapped in half. All my communication was out. And so I was pretty much stranded in the middle of nowhere there. That's pr it seemed in the book anyway that that was probably the first time you realized just how alone you were out there. I know you knew God was with you, mm -hmm. but knowing that somebody could find you, that they would know that you were in trouble because your communication system was, was gone. Yeah, well, you know, they say that every sailor at some point in their sailing career reaches their breaking point and they get pushed past that point. And there comes a, a point where there's nothing more that they can do and they, they call on God, yeah. whether or not they're a Christian. And, you know, that was definitely my, my point there. You know, there was nothing left to do. What did God teach you through all of this, Abby? I think about this, I mean, just looking at the, the visuals that we've seen, this little boat bobbing around in the middle of this very big ocean. And while that was a rogue wave, you went through some tremendous storms by yourself where you just kind of hunkered down in there. And I can't imagine feeling the vastness and the power of the ocean and not being afraid. Yeah, well, you know, the whole, through the book, it's just the story. It's so much more than just, you know, a 16-year-old girl out on a boat in the middle of the ocean. It's really just the story of faith. And, you know, I'd always grown up a Christian, and so you never really question it. But yeah. when you're out there and you're having to put all your faith in God, when you're relying on Him for your life, you know, it's, it's really an amazing story. It, it really is an amazing story. You're an amazing girl. We have some questions from our chat room I'd like to ask you. Susan asks, how did you train for such a massive expedition? You trained on many different levels. Yeah, well, really, you know, I trained my whole life just the way my childhood was. But then, you know, when I first decided at 13 I wanted to sail around the world, my parents said no because I didn't have enough experience. And so for three years, I trained hard for the specific, you know, challenge of sailing around the world. And physically, you train, trained yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you needed that. <laughs> it was good that you did that, right? Yeah. Okay, this is Karen, and she says, were you disappointed that you didn't make it around the world or just relieved to be alive? You know, 
Disappointed a little bit, you know. Mm. I set out for this huge goal, but uh, another thing that I really did learn through my trip is that you know every step you take out in faith towards a goal, towards a bigger goal, is a little success all in itself. Yeah. And so you know. What I did accomplish, yeah, I, I can be proud of that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I actually think it took a <laughs> tremendous amount of maturity to make the decision to say, I'm going to pull the plug on this. I'm going to let people know I need help. You know, sometimes in life people struggle with that, especially when they have a goal or they've got their eyes set on something. Knowing when you need to call on somebody is an important thing. It's an amazing book. It's an amazing adventure. I want to predict that you should watch for the movie. <laughs> Abby's Journal is chronicled. It's a new book, Unsinkable, a young woman's courageous battle on the high seas. It will impress you. This is available in stores nationwide. Abby, thank you so much for sharing your adventure with us. Thank you. Great story. Gordy? Well, still ahead, a runner has a brush with death. I didn't know about a tornado warning. And when it hit me, it, it, it went from 10 or 15 miles an hour of the wind to 200 miles an hour all at once. How he survived the full force of a tornado by hanging onto a tree. Brenda, you gotta see the video I saw in the 700 Club. I pray God will do the same awesome work in your life. Go to CBN.com to I Saw It on the 700 Club for a fast, easy way to see and share your favorite videos. Everywhere I turn, people are talking about gold prices. Gold has risen to new records, and gold prices have tripled over the last six years. In fact, gold prices have increased every year for the past 10 years. Isn't it time you considered adding gold to your portfolio? It's easy to own gold that can be delivered directly to you. Call Goldline now and speak with an account executive. They'll walk you through the steps to get started and answer any questions you may have. Goldline. A company that's been in business for 50 years with over a half a billion dollars in revenue and a top rating from the Better Business Bureau. Call Goldline for your free investor's kit. It provides important information about gold and shows you how to get started. If you've been thinking about owning gold but don't know how, call Goldline, a company that's been helping investors like you acquire gold for 50 years. Give us a call today and learn why gold should be a part of your future and your family's future. Welcome back to the 700 Club. North Korea says it will indict an American who was reportedly doing missionary work in that country. Jun Yong Su has been behind bars since November. He admits to committing a crime against the nation, but North Korean officials have not said what that crime is. South Korean media reports that his crime was spreading Christianity. Operation Blessing is working with a team from the Mayo Clinic to improve health in Haiti. Doctors and nurses from the clinic have been arriving on the island since February. The teams are treating patients with head traumas, collapsed lungs, strokes, cholera, and more. They're also able to provide medical training to hospital staff. Mayo medical staff are working at two main hospitals in Port-au-Prince and at Operation Blessing Zanmi Benny Children's Home. Operation Blessing began a partnership with the Mayo Clinic two years ago in El Salvador, the partnership has now expanded to Honduras as well as Haiti. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website. That's at ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be right back. If you have diabetes and love food, pay attention to this free offer. Hi, I'm Nicole Johnson. I've had diabetes for years and I love food. To me, there's nothing tastier than rich chocolate cake. Except maybe crispy oven fried chicken or cheesy potato skins. Mmm. Get these recipes and many more free in these amazing diabetes cookbooks. If you have diabetes and are on Medicare, you qualify for these three free cookbooks. Call 1-800-794-9898. Enjoy dozens of yummy recipes for desserts, main dishes, snacks, and more. Plus, get this free guide to planning delicious, diabetes-friendly meals. So call now and get cooking. For your three free cookbooks and free meal planning guide, call 1-800-794-9898. That's 1-800-794-9898.
In April 2009, a killer tornado touched down in central Tennessee. For more than 20 miles, it splintered trees, toppled homes, and destroyed nearly everything in its path, except for David Young. On the afternoon of Good Friday, David Young drove to his favorite running trail near his home in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. David's a pastor and wanted time to pray and prepare for the upcoming church services. He began his run despite the ominous clouds on the horizon. I knew there were storms coming. I didn't know we had a tornado watch and certainly didn't know about a tornado warning. Two miles into his run, the storm arrived. David didn't know it, but the full force of an EF4 tornado was headed right for him. As it starts to rain, I recognized that, you know, it could get serious here, but I was really kind of excited about it. I thought, hey, I I've been looking for some sort of survival situation, and here's a good one. David had been through storms before. While winter backpacking a few months earlier, he panicked as hypothermia set in during an unexpected storm. Every day since that backpacking trip in February, I had been saying to God, don't ever let me panic again. You keep me calm no matter what happens. When was the point that you realized you were in trouble? I could hear a rumble in the distance. My, my head kept saying to my gut, there's no way this is a tornado. Across town, David's family huddled together in a grocery store as the tornado passed by. My son, my 13-year-old son, wouldn't sit down. Instead, he stood up and he was just pacing back and forth. And several of them kept saying, you need to come over here with us. And he kept saying, no, if it's OK with you, I need to pace and pray for my dad, praying specifically for me. They didn't know I was out on the trail. As the tornado approached, David darted off the trail and wrapped himself around the base of a nearby tree. As soon as I saw the debris, I began to hear the forest explode above me. The sound of the trees crashing was, it was just unbelievable. It, it was a, a thousand trees exploding all at once. It was almost deafening, the sound of the trees. And when it hit me, it, it, it went from 10 or 15 miles an hour of the wind to 200 miles an hour all at once. But you didn't let go. Oh, no, I wasn't going to let go. Now, wherever the tree went, I was going. But I was not going to let go of that tree. David held tight as the winds lifted his body in the air. Bushes and trees were uprooted and smashed all around him. And then the eye of the tornado passed over me. So I dropped down, and I curled back around the tree again. And as I looked up, it was the most phenomenal thing I've ever seen. It was peaceful, it was calm, and at the very top of the tornado, the debris didn't move to the left or the right, it moved up and down. And my first thought was that I'm in heaven and these are angels dancing up and down. It looked like angels just performing a little ballet at the top. And I lay there and I looked up and I remember feeling warm and loved and thinking to myself, you know, this is, this is the greatest gift that uh, God could ever have given me. You felt the love of God in the eye of a tornado. It's hard to explain that, but it's true. Yeah, I did. I felt God's love right in the middle of the eye of the tornado. But David's moment of tranquility was short-lived. And then when the back wall hit, it hit with as much violence as the front wall, and it began to drop the things. And it, it didn't feel as though trees were dropping. It felt as though they were being thrown, thrown down on the ground hard. At first, I was thinking to myself, you know, this is, this is unbelievable. Of all things, I'm in the middle of a tornado. By the time the back wall had hit me, uh, I was thinking, okay, this has got to end pretty soon. I, I won't make it much longer if this keeps going. Two trees came crashing down on top of David. One smashed his left leg, and the other hit his head, giving him a concussion and a deep gash. But he was alive. As the tornado passed, David scrambled over the debris and made his way up toward the street. The reality of what just happened began to sink in. It looked like a nuclear bomb had gone off. Just 30 seconds before, there had been a beautiful forest, and now it appeared that every tree in the forest was down. There was twisted debris everywhere, pieces of buildings, huge chunks of buildings. There was the entire side of a semi-tractor trailer was down there on a tree right next to me, wrapped around that tree. David made his way to a nearby parking lot, then was rushed to the hospital by men who found him there. They put uh, seven or eight staples in my head, and they said uh, to stop the bleeding. I was. I would have bled to death, uh, wrapped my leg up, and uh, best we can tell, it was just beat up badly. It may, again, may have been a hairline fracture, but, but nothing serious. Easter Sunday, David walked out in front of his church and preached a sermon that was born in the eye of a tornado. What was your message? Message was that regardless of how bad the storm is, Christ is risen. And one of the things that I've thought about often is that 
holding onto that tree in the middle of the storm is just a wonderful metaphor for a life that if we cling to the cross of Christ, holding onto that tree, even if you don't know what's coming next, if you don't know how bad it's gonna be, regardless of how much debris is slamming around you, you hang onto that tree and God's gonna take care of it. And he will take care of it. He'll take care of it for you. And you've, we've, we've got to understand that in the middle of the storm, that's when his grace is, is overwhelming. Not just a little bit, but we'll find that it's overwhelming us. That we know that all things work together for good. All things. All things. You can be in the middle of a tornado, tornado and understand it's all working together for good. I'm going to come through this. Jesus is going to see me through. Now, what about you? What about you right now? Is life throwing a storm your way? Do you have needs? Do you have financial needs? Do you have needs with your family? Do you have needs for healing? Are, are there things that just seem completely out of your control? Well, that's the time to cling to Jesus. It's not the time for grumbling, complaining. It's the time to realize he's your rock. He's your fortress. He'll see you through. All you have to do is lean into him and he'll take care of it because he does work all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So just fulfill those two things. Do you love him? Do you love him in the middle of what you're going through? Do you love him? And are you called according to his purpose? If those things are true, then all things are working together for your good. Now, we're going to pray. Before we pray, we want to encourage you with some other people who have been through some storms, and Jesus has seen them through. Here's Ben. He was, had a minor heart attack uh, on March 21st. Two days later, he went to the emergency room because of a premature ventricular contraction. These incidents have me very stressed. On April 1st, I was watching the 700 Club. Terry, you had a word of knowledge about a person with heart problems. You said, you're scheduled to see a doctor for follow-up, but you're already healed. That includes all stress that you've had because of this. Well, on April 6th, both the heart test and the stress test came out normal, and Ben is praising God. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, this is Russell. He writes and says, Gordon and Terry were praying at the end of the show. My wife walked into the room just as you started to pray. I kindly asked my wife to stop talking because you were praying. <laughs> right at that moment, Gordon, you said, you have a growth or cyst behind your right ear. It's getting smaller and smaller right now. God is healing that. Just believe it and thank him. That was for my wife, says Russell. She had a painful growth for more than a month. That cyst is totally gone. <laughs> Amen. All right. Let's just believe God. Uh, if you have a need for healing, uh, I'm, faith is an act. Uh, so lay a hand in an act of faith. Lay a hand on that area that needs healing. The Bible says that the prayer of faith will raise you up. All you have to do is believe. Now, you just it's believing some great facts. The great fact that Jesus died for you, that by his stripes you were healed, and that he didn't just stay on a cross. He didn't stay in a grave. He rose again. And that same resurrection power is in you. That same power is in you. And you can release it. The word can become flesh again. All you have to do is speak the word, lay hands on it, and you will be healed. Now, if two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done. These aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus. So we're going to agree. You agree. And let's speak to it and see what God does for you right now. Lord Jesus, we just come to you right now and we just praise you. We praise you for the finished work of the cross. When you announced it's finished, you announced it for all time, for all mankind, for all of us, you announced it's finished. You have done the work of reconciliation. We are reconciled to God through you. And you paid the price for all our sins. You paid the price for all our diseases. You bore them all. 
you've taken them all away. And so as people are praying right now, we just join in agreement with them, touching that which needs healing. And we say to it, be healed now in Jesus' name and be restored mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've got a painful growth on your tongue and you're, and you're really worried about it. You're worried, is it, is it cancer? Uh, what is this? And, and God is just healing it for you right now. He's taking it away right now in Jesus' name. There's someone else you're laying hands on your left knee. You've got tremendous pain on the inside of the knee, and it just went numb. It just, it, it, it's gone. The pain's gone now in Jesus' name. What you couldn't do before, do now. Begin moving that knee and realize you've got complete movement again. And it's never going to be sore again. You're healed in Jesus' name. Tara? Someone else, you, um, you need some restoration financially. And this is a round number, but it's very specific to you. You've been praying for and you need $50,000. I'm not sure what you need it for, but God's going to supply that for you, but not in a conventional way. It's going to come in so unconventionally that you're going to know that God provided that for you. But he sees your need and hears your cry. Um, there's a man, your name is Marcel, and, and God has heard your cry. He's going to answer your prayer. Uh, he's coming to you, uh, and, he's, and he's, he's got the answer with him right now. In Jesus' name, just receive that and receive the peace that comes with knowing that he hears you, he sees you, and he understands. There are many people crying out for financial miracles, uh, mortgage payments, rent payments, that are due, bills that are due, and there's not enough money. God wants to provide for, your, for his people, for the sheep of his pasture. And so we just speak faith for financial miracles, and we just ask for uh, miracles of employment, miracles of favor, uh, that there would just be favor with God's people. Mm -hmm. There's someone, you have some kind of a bone condition. Um, causes not so much a deterioration of your bones, but kind of a weakening of them, like your, your bones um, just become misshapen. God is healing that condition for you, and you're just going to begin to feel like a warmth that's throughout your whole body. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for, for what you're doing, for what you have done. And Lord, we just make all these requests known uh, all our prayers known to you for when we give you the burden, we don't have to carry it anymore. Just take it all away now. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've been touched by God, we want to share in your good report. We always rejoice in what God is doing in the world today. So give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. And we're here for you if you need prayer. It's our honor. It's our privilege to pray with you. And we're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you need someone to agree with you in prayer, give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. Terry? Well, still ahead, time for your questions from our chat room. Stay tuned for Bring It Online when we come back. Hi, I'm Terry Mewson. At CBN, we're here to pray for you all year long. But each spring, the entire staff of CBN sets aside a special week of prayer to pray for your needs. We care about you and the things that are happening in your life. No matter how big or small your requests, we want to pray for you. Please mail your prayer request today. It's our privilege to pray for you. I was in a lot of pain. I remember feeling, I don't want to have cancer. Why is this happening? I went to pray with my 10-year-old. He said that he wished he had two hearts because one of them was breaking. I had to reassure her a lot that I'm going to be okay. Things are going to be all right. You know, God's on our side. This is one thing that Cancer Treatment Center does for people. They give them the courage and the strength to battle cancer. When you first walk in that building, you almost feel like there's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is about the patient. It is only about the patient. And what is it that they need and what do they want? Call now and we'll send you this free DVD that shows you how our very special team of experts and caregivers put you at the center of everything we do. Hope is alive at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I don't really see how anyone can get through a life-threatening 
disease without the Lord in their life. He gives us the strength that we need to carry on. Next week. We started like a little own crew. He was a real life good fella. I wasn't afraid, I had no fear. A regular wise guy. These guys took my back, I was connected to somebody. This hitman wanted to run the mob. I was known as the up and coming star. Until the mob ran him off. I'm Robert the Crackhead, and I'm gonna die Robert the Crackhead. Monday on The 700 Club. Being a bricklayer is a tough enough job as it is. For the man in our next story, that job became even tougher when he had to work through excruciating pain. Every morning at 4.30 a.m., Diodora leaves his home and takes a two-hour bus ride to his job. He works as a brick and cement mason at one of the largest cemeteries in Guatemala. But for more than a year, problems with his hands have made it very painful for Diodoro to handle the lime and other chemicals in the concrete. The pain came from the cracks in my skin, but it felt like the pain went all the way to my bones in my hands. And every day when my hands contact the lime and cement, my hands radiate with heat. Diodora forces himself to work through the chronic pain because he loves his wife and three young stepdaughters. This is Carmen, one of the twins. We love him like he's a real dad. Diodora has no money to see a doctor and food is actually a higher priority right now. So he gathers the girls together and asks them to pray. Soon after that prayer, Operation Blessing set up a mobile medical clinic to care for workers at the cemetery. There, a doctor diagnosed the condition and gave Diodora some cream to treat the cracks in his skin. But after a month, the condition was no better, so we provided Diodora with an antifungal cream. When that didn't work, we took him to see a dermatologist. Once his skin was open, it became infected with a fungus that went into his bloodstream. So Operation Blessing paid for a very expensive, broad-spectrum antifungal drug, which Diodora could not afford. And within a few weeks, his hands were as good as new. Thanks to CBN and Operation Blessing for treating my hands. Now I am able to work without pain. I am happy because my new daddy's hands are all better. They were very rough before, but now they are soft and smooth. Can you imagine having open cuts on your hand and having to carry that bucket full of stuff with that cutting handle on the bucket? Just so much pain, so much need in the, the world medically, and so little availability of help. And yet, if you're a 700 Club member, you're changing that in the lives of thousands of people around the world, really every day. We have medical clinics, doctors provide surgeries. There's so much that you make possible, and we want to say thank you for that, not just for Diodora, but for all of the thousands of others whose lives are being touched by your generosity. We also bring with that the message of the love of Jesus Christ. If you're not a 700 Club member, this is a great day to join because we really can make a difference when we partner together. That's a commitment of 65 cents a day, $20 a month, but it makes you a part of the family of ministries here that reaches out to the world with the love of Christ. If you'd like to do that, if you'd like to be a part of what we're doing, go to your phone and call right now. Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-759. There it is on your screen, 0700. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Our way of saying thank you to you for caring about other people is to send you this teaching from Gordon and Pat. It's called The Law of Expectation. We believe it will bless your own walk with the Lord, and you'll have the satisfaction and the joy of knowing that you are changing lives from the moment you make that phone call. So please call now. And by the way, you can also join with us by logging on to CBN.com. Gordon? Okay, it's time for some live chat questions. The first one comes in from Sandy. It says, I love my family doctor, but he's Hindu. Is it wrong for me to go to a Hindu doctor? Do I have to find a Christian doctor? Terry, what do you think about that one? Well, <clears throat> I actually had an Indian doctor for a long time. And um, I, 
I mean, Jesus says we're to be in the world, but not of the world. And um, he was a wonderful man, a fabulous doctor. And we had many spiritual discussions together. You know, I think Mm -hmm. we're supposed to engage people in our walk on a regular basis. And it was never an an issue for me that he didn't share the same faith that I did. Today, he's retired. Today, I have a doctor who shares the same faith. And we talk about missions and (laughs) all (laughs) kinds of things. But, you know, I think we, we need to engage the people that come into our lives in whatever arena um, as friends, Mm -hmm. you know, to embrace the gift of life we have together and the journey that we're on and share the things of our heart with each other. What do you think? I I think it's fine. Why why would there be anything wrong with, um, you know? We're not to be set apart and not willing to, to know or or love or touch or, you know, live amongst people who are different than uh, we. It's, it's always good to know that uh, whoever's giving you medical care is praying for you. Yes. But um, I wouldn't say it's wrong uh, mm-hmm. to do others. All right. Hey, this is Melissa who says, I homeschool my son. We were going to read Huck Finn together, but I'm disturbed by the use of the N-word. Still, the book has a wonderful message, and I don't want him to miss out on a classic. What do you think I should do? Um, Melissa, that's one of the classics of um, American literature. Uh, I would encourage you, yeah, read that. Tom Sawyer, um, I'm a real fan of Mark Twain. Uh, he wasn't a believer either. Um, yeah. uh, he has, one of his critiques of Christianity is, is quite scathing. But, yeah. um, but a great opportunity for discussion. You know, when you're homeschooling, that's to me the plus and the benefit of all of that is you get to take something like a classic and then sit and talk with your child about mm-hmm. your values and, and, you know, what was happening when that book was being written, but how the world functions today and what's right, what's wrong, what we do, what we don't do. It's a great opportunity. Well, Huck Finn is one of the, the classics because it takes on prejudice uh, and does so using the language of the day mm-hmm. um, and the, the way that language dehumanized people. Um, and it, it, it is brilliantly done. Uh, and I would, I, would, I would highly recommend it. So. Mm-hmm. I All agree. Right. Here's another question. Is it possible to sell your soul to the <laughs> devil? If I say I'd sell my soul for fame or riches or whatever, does that stick? And they don't want to leave their name either. That's anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what you think about that. I think it's a, it's a short-lived sale, can I just say. <laughs> Bad choice. But I think there are people, there have been he- people historically who, you know, have said uh, rather than deal with eternity. I I want the benefits of the here and now. Does it stick? I mean, this is what I know about Jesus. He loves you. He paid the price for your soul. He's always there. Um, I I think it's pretty scary to wait until the 11th hour to decide you want to follow him. But (laughs) but does it stick? God's God's redemption is always available. What do you think? He paid the price. You, You are redeemed. Realize that. You've been bought with a price. And his price outweighs whatever bargain you think you've done. Uh, We've all sinned. Uh, We've all followed our own desires and have those desires lead us away from God. But the great news, Jesus paid the price. He bought us back. We leave you these words from Jeremiah 33. I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. For all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again. Next week, we started like our little own crew. He was a real life good fella. I wasn't afraid, I had no fear. A regular wise guy. These guys took my back, I was connected to somebody. This hitman wanted to run the mob. I was known as the up and coming star. Until the mob ran him off. I'm Robert the Crackhead, I'm gonna die Robert the Crackhead. Monday on the 700 Club. Come on and cross over to the all-new Cross Country Radio from CBN.com. Cross Country, where country...